Hello, and welcome to our session today uh, in the Customer Success Conference. We're going to spend some time together talking about the science of behavioral economics and how that applies to the uh, art of customer success and making your customer success uh, organization and operation more successful. If um, you've been in the customer success or customer support world for any length of time, you've probably uh, sent an email or said the words why with a lot of question marks after it. Uh, you do uh, all the work you're supposed to do. Uh, you follow the process. You follow your playbooks. Your execution is right and, and even exceptional. And then you feel like your customer is acting irrationally. And you ask yourself and anyone who will listen, you ask why. Um, well, the answer is they are, answer, they are acting irrationally. We all do. Uh, what we'll do today is kind of drive in into and trying to understand why they're acting the way they are. And we'll use the, uh, the principles from behavioral economics to do that. We'll spend a little bit of time you know, understanding the theory. Uh, but in every case, we're going to try to you know, jump to uh, real life examples and practical applications. Um, and so you can try to figure out how do I apply you know, what, what the learnings are uh, in day to day operations. And then lastly, we'll talk about something that not necessarily behavioral economics, but in a related field of customer effort. Uh, I'll be your, your host through the conversation today. Uh, I consider myself to be a customer success geek, which uh, means I enjoy uh, trying to learn things in other domains and, uh, and apply them in customer success and stay up to date on the latest research, which is why I'm sharing some of this with you today. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, experience, as you can tell from the gray hair, across uh, companies uh, from very large to startup, and we'll We'll use some of that experience to inform our conversation today. So behavioral economics uh, deals with how and why humans behave in ways that aren't strictly rational or don't strictly follow economic principles of value and trade-offs. Um, if you want to get uh, deep into the subject, uh, the, what I would recommend is the book Predictably Irrational by Dan O'Reilly. There's some more academic tomes behind it, but he does a great job covering the broad uh, brush of the theory um, and giving lots of great examples so you can understand some of the aspects of that. Uh, when it comes to application, um, my suggestion would be decisive, and a lot of the things I'm going to cover in this presentation today uh, come from there. Uh, they do, uh, Dan and Chip Heath uh, have several uh, business books out, and they do a great job um, applying those principles. So not just talking about theoretically or academically, but talking about now that you know those things, how do you actually have techniques to deal with them to to affect them? Uh, the book Decisive is is generally centered on decision making, but it's actually pretty broadly applicable uh, in your business uh, dealings. Um, let's dive in. So uh, there's a lot of concepts in behavioral economics. Uh, I thought we'd just focus today on three. Uh, one being confirmation bias. Um, you've heard that term no doubt before. Uh, in a broad sense, we're going to talk about it in a very specific uh, business and customer success sense. And then a couple of you know topics in the area of choices and decisions and the options and defaults that surround all of that. So let's start with an irrational behavior or one that every customer success manager thinks is irrational, which is uh, surprise churn. So... Uh, your customer has been giving you every indication that they're, you know, they're the perfect customer. They're they're never going to leave you. Their SAT scores are awesome. They're, you know, a promoter on your NPS. They've uh, they've been a reference for you. They've, you know, filled out the reviews on the review sites. And then time comes to renew, and suddenly um, they're telling you they're not going to renew, and they churn. Um, 
there's probably many reasons that could be behind that, but you know, you really want to understand why did I not see that coming? Why, why did I not know that there was some risk there in time for me to act? Because obviously I want to be able to get ahead of anything like that. Well, the answer, one of the answers might be that there is confirmation bias built in in subtle ways into your customer success processes and your people. And what do I mean by that? Well, we tend in a lot of cases to ask questions that the, in themselves, they're actually prone to getting confirmation bias on both sides in the response. And what we really need to be asking are disconfirming questions. Uh, and we'll talk about what disconfirming questions look like, but you need to be very careful to fight the confirmation bias that can sometimes creep into those conversations. All right, so what does this look like? Let's let's pick an example outside of customer success just to get a general idea. Uh, and a good one would be uh, interviewing. And uh, one of the areas that uh, someone being interviewed always cares about is, you know, what's the expectation about work-life balance at this company that I'm considering joining? Um, our tendency is to ask actually, you know, confirmation bias prone questions such as, well, you're a, you would be a peer, how's the work-life balance here, right? That seems like a good question, seems like you would get an answer. You might ask that, you might ask, how hard are, is everybody working? You know, what's the environment like? How intense is it here? You know, those are okay questions. They're very general questions, but you're likely to get warm, fuzzy, general answers. Yeah, you know, we work hard, but you know, you do have the ability to balance your life, you know, with your work. And yeah, you get that kind of very general answer. What's a disconfirming question in the situation? That would be something that's more along the lines of, well, how many uh, nights did you have dinner with your family in the last two weeks? Right. Um, how many weekends have you worked in the last month? Those are very different, more intense questions to get to the same answer. And you're going to get a different answer and a different type of answer if you ask that kind of a disconfirming question. So that's a general example. How does this apply in the world of customer success? Well. I would argue that some of the confirming questions we asked are, are you satisfied? Are you getting value? Are you happy? <clears throat> Those aren't necessarily bad questions, but they are questions that are prone to get you general, warm, fuzzy, positive answers. Sure, we're happy, right? We don't have any immediate issues. Everything's okay. Um, and if your folks want to hear that and want to hear that the customer is happy, um, that makes it even warmer and fuzzier. So how would we ask disconfirming questions in this light? Well, here's an example. Um, if you asked your customer, if your boss said you had to give up 50% of your budget spend in our whatever our particular category, software, services, et cetera, would we be on your list of must-haves? Again, much more specific and much harder edge question that actually looks ahead to what might be an actual situation that could happen and could you know, drive churn. Um, another example, <clears throat> if, if a competitor came along and had a meeting with you and they offered a 30% cheaper version of our whatever our, and whatever we offer our product category and it had say 80% of what we offer, would you consider switching? Would you be talking about switching? If so, why? Again, very specific question to an actual situation that might occur versus are you happy? I could be very happy and this situation could arise and I could end up you know, still churning. And lastly, another example would be, are you aware of any plans, strategies, or changes in your overall environment that's going to happen in the next six months that could make a difference in your use of our products slash services? Uh, again, 
I could be happy, but you know, we're also planning to change out all our equipment and we won't need you anymore. So, you know, it, hopefully you get a sense of how you ask questions that are not general questions, but more very specific targeted questions to elicit a different type of response when you're probing customers for churn risk. They can feel uncomfortable. Um, and actually that's a good thing because you know what? It's when you're asking comfortable questions and getting comfortable answers, that's when you uh, get your biases triggered and that's when surprise can happen. So application. Um, there's nothing wrong with asking NPS questions, SAT questions, loyalty questions. You should continue to do that, but you do want to look at how you're assessing your customers and make some decisions about, you know, should I add some more intense disconfirming questions into that, you know, portfolio of, of you know, testing? Um, and, you know, maybe it's not all customers, maybe it's some problem customers, maybe it's, you know, customers that we're taking for granted, but really go look at, is there an opportunity to fight that confirmation bias that might be resulting in the surprise churn you're seeing? All right, so that's number one, uh, confirmation bias. Another irrational behavior that we can encounter in customer success is that customers actually respond differently to questions or decisions depending on how we structure them, whether they're you know, binary or multiple choice. So um, again, this comes straight out of behavioral uh, economics world. We frame a lot of our decisions as yes, no, um, as binary versus having a set of you know, options to offer and to work from. Again, let's step back and, and maybe step outside customer success and think of yourself as a consumer. Um, you have an internet problem, cable problem, which is you know super critical these days where we're spending our lives uh, on Zoom lately uh, and you're having intermittent service down issues. So you call your internet provider, your cable provider, and you're dreading, of course, the well, you need to be home and available for so many hours to resolve this, because uh, in this day and age, we're all scheduled from uh, morning to night with uh, things we need to go do. So think about two different ways that that uh, internet provider or cable company can, can offer uh, options for you. One is, <clears throat> okay, you, uh, you have an important issue and you're down, we'll get someone out there tomorrow and there it is. We need you to just be available sometime between one and five and we'll, the tech will drop by when he has a gap in his schedule and we can't tell you when. But an alternative would be, you know, a little explanation, obviously, you know, hey, you're calling, we have a full schedule, we can offer you a choice. If you really have to, you know, pick a specific more limited slot, we can do that for you, but it'll be later this week, it won't be tomorrow. Uh, if you absolutely need us out there tomorrow, sure, we can do that. But unfortunately, that means we're going to have to give you a longer window because we can't you know, guarantee that we'll have someone out there to see. So, you know, in this case, you know, the customer actually, and the research will show it, they're actually happier because they get to choose what option they prefer based on their own criteria. In this case, if I'm the customer, I get to choose based on well, how urgent is this versus how inconvenient is it for me to have to wait and not and be available in a four hour window versus you just have to wait for a four hour window because that's the only option I gave you. So it really does make a big difference in how customers respond when you can offer them options along these lines. So again, bringing it back home into customer success, you know, would you like to renew early? is a yes, no question we might throw out there for a customer versus setting it up more explicitly as a set of options. Hey, we actually have an option that lets you renew early and you know what, we're providing an extra discount or extra months on the end of it. Um, so if you're interested, we could do that. Or if not, we can renew you at your regular time, but it, it would be certainly at the current rate uh, that you're paying. So again, as a customer, I get to decide, do I have the time and, and energy right now to be able to do that given I get you know, maybe some budget that, that I get back and I get to look like a hero because I've reduced costs? Or 
is this a crazy busy time? And I just can't do that right now. It's now my choice um, versus would you like to renew early where I just say no. Another good example, executive business reviews, super important for the relationship, always hard to, uh, to get arranged and to get studied. But a lot of times we just say, we want to do a business review. Will you do it? Yes, no. Versus offering the customer some real choices, right? Certainly we preface it, explain why, but offering a choice of, you know, hey, our best choice, we really would love to get 60 minutes to sit down with you as our stakeholder, you know, uh, economic buyer and talk about, you know, what the results have been, what your success is, KPIs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if that's not an option for you within the next, you know, X period of time, two weeks, three weeks, et cetera, another option would be we can send you kind of a summary report and just have a shorter meeting where we focus on what actions you want us to take uh, to, to make this more valuable to you. Or if you're just unable to meet at all in this period, um, how about we send you a summary report and then do back and forth on any questions or actions. So again, we're not just saying either have a business review with me or not. We're actually offering some real choices to the customer and they can make a trade-off of how important it is, how valuable it'll be compared to other things on their plate. So again, you know, the actions you might want to think about is uh, really having that focus on am I you know, forcing the customer to make a binary decision in this matter, or, you know, should I offer a set of choices? And, you know, it doesn't mean everything always has to have a choice. Some things are really super simple, yes, no's, but especially in difficult situations where there are some you know, <clears throat> substantial trade-offs um, that the customer might have to make, uh, really thinking about how to present those as options. <clears throat> The other thing I would add is um, for this to work, those have to be legitimate options. This isn't a game where it's like, well, I will share four really terrible things that the customer doesn't want. So he'll pick this one thing that I really do want him to choose. So um, not the folks in customer success who really care about customers like we all do would do that. Just, you know, it, it, there's a little bit of a tendency to think about trying to push you know, an option by how you set up the choices and you have to be careful to be completely high integrity as you throw that out. So that's our second area of irrational behavior and thoughts about how to, you know, how to address that. Lastly, on the irrational front, we'll talk about defaults. And, you know, again, this is a, something that is, you know, broadly seen and shown, not just anything in customer success, but UI customers choose the default option uh, when we have a choice out of proportion to any other choice. What does that look like? Well, again, here's a couple of examples out in the world. Um, in the early days of the switch from pension plans to 401k savings, uh, 401k was an option and you had a choice, did I wanna participate in that program, did I not? And there were huge efforts to educate folks, to offer incentives, to remind them multiple times, and that got the participation rate up to 34%. When uh, some folks used some behavioral economic principles and switched it to where you were you know, automatically in the program and you had to decide, I don't wanna be in the program, the participation rate went up to 90%. That makes no sense, right? I mean, honestly, it's exactly the same decision. Do I wanna be in the program? Do I not wanna be in the program? Why should it make any difference as to whether one is the default or the other is the default? If we were rational beings, it wouldn't. We're not always rational. And, you know, again, you can look at some of the, the books I mentioned earlier to go a little deeper, but, but basically there's a certain amount of inertia and effort in making a hard decision um, and, that causes us to sometimes fall back into the fault. And speaking of you know, bigger impact decisions, you see the same thing uh, applies in the world of organ donation, where when you move from an opt out, um, from an opt in to an opt out, you get a much, much higher participation level. 
So for CX, let's let's look at an example there. And this is one from from my past a couple of companies ago. We did the usual post engagement, post transaction support survey, and we were committed to success. So we asked a question, you know, it's kind of our escape valve question. Would you like a manager to contact you because you had some problem with this support uh, you know, issue and its resolution? So great, we made that commitment. Occasionally we would, we would get a customer who gives us like perfect scores and all 10 and you know, uh, Margaret was awesome. And then they also check the box that says they wanna follow up. Well, that's highly likely to be a false positive. Um, and you know, we committed to talk to the customer, so we gotta follow up on that. We have to know his issue. How do we do that without causing undue work? And the way we did that is we set up the default for the customer the right way. We basically said, look, you gave us a high rating and great comments, and then you said there was an issue. We're going to assume that was just an error you made in filling out the survey. And if that's the case, don't need to do anything. If you do need to talk to us, let me know. So we gave them options. First of all, you could see that. Secondly, the default is it, they don't actually have to do anything if it was just a mistake. So we set up a good default that was mutually beneficial. So it helps them, they, they don't have to do as much, and it helps us because we don't end up with some open action that we end up following up and following up and nagging and maybe eventually closing for a lack of response. And again, I'd say this applies a lot of times with customer success interactions. When you're trying to get something to be closed, when you're responding to requests, there's lots of opportunities to take a look at this. So from an application standpoint, really do take a look at what are the default behaviors you set up when you offer choices in your customer communications and actions and redesign it so that the default is the slickest, smoothest, easiest, and is mutually beneficial. So switching from totally irrational, perhaps, to rational, um, you know, there was some great work done a few years ago about uh, customer effort, and I'll touch on that you know, briefly to, to finish up our conversation today. And what this research said was the amount of effort that customers have to spend to resolve an issue or a problem actually has an outsized impact on their long-term loyalty. Um, article was in Harvard Business Review and there was a follow-up uh, book covering this as well. And let's just walk through, well, we won't go outside CS, we'll stay in CS for this one. Let's say that your primary contact as a CSM finds out that one of the end users can't log in, they suddenly, you know, one day get an invalid user message. Well, you know, the effort it takes them to resolve that could be something that looks something like this, right? Lots and lots of steps, uh, lots and lots of outreach, back and forth. Oh, I missed it. Now I need to come back and follow up later. Um, you know, this, you've probably experienced this, um, or you may even have this as, you know, a process that exists within your company. As opposed to an experience like, hey, one of my users can't log in, support already knows that this happens to be a subscription overrun situation, and they are authorized to fix that and resolve it. And you know, the ultimate subscription, you know, work gets done later. Hugely different amount of effort if you add up all the work on the steps and in between all those steps for the customer. So the, the application here, really take time to look at what are the top three reasons your customers are contacting you from a customer success standpoint, and then put their shoes on really walk through what are you asking them to do to get those things resolved? Renewals or checking on subscription rates or any number of things. Really take the time to walk through that and think about what does that look like? And if you have to mystery shop to do that, you that's a good way to go after it. If not, then actually doing a walkthrough um, and you know, having that happen in a conference room with the, you know, with the whiteboards, with everything in place is another great way to do that. I know uh, previously I have um, become a customer and um, actually been put in the system from day one and gone through an enablement process that was handled by the customer success team and got a chance to experience Every email, every meeting request, every document, um, 
And that was incredibly eye-opening in terms of uh, how much we were asking the customer to do, how much we were overwhelming them with uh, information uh, and what that experience actually felt like. Um, if you can do that, if you can accomplish that, then that's a great way to focus in. And even if you just eliminate one or two steps or you know, uh, one step that's super high effort on the customer's side, then I think you'll find customers will start putting you in that, you know, easy to do business with. And I think you'll also see that that is going to pay off long term uh, in your loyalty from your customers as well. So recapping, we've talked about um, a couple areas of you know, behavioral economics we think we might be able to apply, uh, you know, confirmation bias number one, and we talked about how you can, you know, really think about disconfirming questions to, to really get to the heart of where your customer's at. Uh, secondly, making sure that we're offering options because it impacts the way customers respond and how they feel about, you know, options and decisions uh, that you're asking them to make. Third, you know, you know defaults and really thinking about Am I organizing the defaults in my requests and in my customer asks so that uh, so that we take advantage of the fact that they're going to probably choose the default more often than not? And then lastly, really thinking hard about how much effort customers need to expend for the normal interaction tasks that you have from a customer success standpoint. Now, again, I only picked out a handful of things. Um, there in the decisive book, I actually use uh, a number of other uh, techniques and, and uh, tricks and um, you know applications that they have available. I've listed a few of them here, you know, from Uching, which is an interesting one, to pre-mortems, um, uh, which is before a project goes forward, let's uh, assume it failed and then hold it like we're doing a postmortem, but we do it before we ever launch to try to think of what are some reasons that this could have failed? It's a different way of thinking that opens up potentially risks and problems that you don't always see uh, when you're in the middle of launching a new project. And another one of my favorites is a realistic job preview. Uh, use this with customers um, in uh, the uh, enablement process, the installation process. There's a tendency to uh, give unrealistic expectations because we want everybody to be super happy and you know this is going to be so fast and so easy. That's not the reality for a lot of products and a lot of implementations. Sometimes they're super hard, and we you actually will find that if you're very realistic while still staying positive and still keeping the benefits you know in line, but clear you know exact expectations we found that our enablements were much more successful. We had fewer dropouts. We had higher customer success when we were more open about the amount of work and what the expectations were. So again, I think that behavioral economics is a great field and very applicable to those of us you know, working in the customer success um, uh, industry. So hopefully this has uh, spurred some thoughts and some, uh, some applications that you'll be able to apply as you uh, continue on in your work. So thanks for your time today. Appreciate your time and attention. And we'll hopefully get a chance to interact in the future.